Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Encompass webinar series. Thanks for joining us once again. Uh, my name is Chris Shipley. I'm the Executive Director of Public Policy for Encompass. Uh, we are excited to be here today to hear from Steve Augustino and Jason Epstein, partners from Nelson Mullins, uh, as they discuss gener generative AI, one of the most important topics uh, here in Washington, D.C. at the moment. Uh, they're going to cover a host of topics related to this issue, uh, including generative AI's potential business applications, uh, legal and policy issues that may arise, uh, as well as strategies that businesses are using to identify use cases. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, throughout the webinar, if you have questions, uh, we would ask that you use the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of the Zoom page. Uh, we may try to answer some of these questions over the course of the webinar. Uh, if not, we will get to them uh, before the webinar closes. So uh, appreciate you all populating the, the Q&A uh, section uh, with those questions that you might have. Uh, and with that, it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to our friends from Nelson Mullins, Steve and Jason. Thanks, guys. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, Encompass, for the opportunity to present this webinar and also for me personally, the opportunity to do a dry run of this a uh, couple of weeks ago at the Encompass show in Tampa. Uh, it was mm -hmm. it was a wonderful session for me, a great opportunity. Uh, we enjoyed it so much. I wanted to do a different version now with my partner, Jason Epstein, who probably knows more about generative AI than anybody else in a law firm at the moment. Um, I'm really honored to be able to, to work with Jason on this and honored to, to have this webinar with you guys today. So um, I will echo what Chris had said. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and put them in as they mm -hmm. come to you. We may answer it. They may be on our next slide, uh, whatever, but don't like save it and hope that you have it at the end. We'll try to leave a few minutes at the end of the, the hour here to answer some questions, but we'll do our best as we move along. So um, with that, I am gonna start our presentation here and um, get us going. Um, Jason, I'm going to rely on you to tell me if I, we're not seeing our cover slide. No, it looks like we I are. I see it. Looks good. Okay. All right. So welcome, everybody. This is uh, our webinar on generative AI called The Scoop on Generative AI. So we want to peer a little bit behind the hype here and walk through some of the issues that uh, you'll be addressing or your customers may be addressing as you move forward. So with that, uh, I want to start with a disclaimer. Um, and uh, this is one you'll probably start to see more and more as time goes on, but uh, no portion of our content today was created using generative AI tools. Um, instead, we created this the old fashioned way, which is uh, specifically that I, I took an old presentation and we mocked that up and updated that and used that. So um, to some degree, that's kind of the way generative AI operates too, but probably more efficient than, uh, than just us doing it. So um, that's where we are. I'm gonna move over. We're gonna go through it first, the, an overview of what generative AI technology is, where it fits, um, and then we'll start to dive into some of the issues. And Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point, just let me know when to be moving the slides, okay? Thank you, Stephen. Hello, everybody. It's great to be with you today. I'm the head of our top team, which is our technology outsourcing procurement and privacy team. And like anybody else who's practicing in this area, we stay ahead of emerging technologies. We'll talk a little bit about that context, but of course, nothing, nothing is bigger now than generative AI. <clears throat> and by now, probably everybody knows uh, what it is, so we won't spend too much time talking about it, but it's really a subset or type of AI. And one of the things we'll talk about is that AI has been around for a long time. It's actually 20, 30, maybe even more years. Of course, because of the advent of technology, it's got more and more intense. And then the advent in particular of generative AI, it's all here right now. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but it's, it's the type of artificial intelligence that can take new content or output and answer questions in an informative way like a human would. And it does this by training on a large amount of data, structured and unstructured. And then when you ask it a question, it tries to predict the answer. And that's really what the definition of generative AI is. It's about the predict prediction of the answer that you're looking for based on the data that it trained from and how these large language models or LLMs work and the algorithms related to them. Incidentally, by the way, 
because it's trying to, in a way, please you and provide you something it thinks you're looking for, that creates the hallucinogenic property and the erroneous properties where when you put certain input in or otherwise known as prompts, everybody's used chat GPT or Bard or Bing or Claude. Uh, when you type something in there, it's called a prompt. And when you enter a prompt, it's going to go back to its database and try to, I would say, please you and figure out what you're looking for and, pr and produce output. That's what you'll find is something that uh, we need to have concern about, not only the input you put in, but relying on the product that comes out. So next slide, Steve. We'll do our best, by the way, to, to stay on top of the, uh, the, the, the Q&A. So I do think it's important to talk about what's different uh, Jeffrey Hinton worked at Google. He's sort of considered the godfather of AI. Basically, he was very concerned about AI and how it can be uh, an incredible boom to society, but also potentially an existential threat. And this presentation doesn't really talk about the existential threat piece, although we do talk a little bit about the ethics in connection with it but it doesn't take long to figure out like any other technology, how it could be used for good, but also how it could be used for bad. But what makes it different is that, and, he, and this is Mr. Hinton's world words, it's as if you had a 10,000 people and someone learned something and everybody knew it and learned it at the same time. <clears throat> um, that's how chatbots can know much more than any one person. That's, something that's really akin to artificial intelligence. If you remember IBM Watson, when IBM Watson came out and it was machine learning AI, uh, it, it would go out in the healthcare industry and search every single article and all the information. And every time something was added, Watson would have that as if it had 1 million people uh, looking and researching, and then it's, it added it to its database. So artificial intelligence generally, but especially generative AI, it, it learns as we go and it learns. And once it learns, it learns from what anybody has put in and any content that was put in. And so it creates sort of a superhuman. In fact, on that topic, there's some serious discussion that in about a decade, give or take, uh, artificial intelligence could actually become self-aware. I know that sounds sci-fi-ish and there's a lot of ethics and responsibility that goes with that. And we'll be talking a lot about it today, but that's the level of intelligence we're talking about. And that's why Jeffrey Hinton was couching it as something that's a different kind of intelligence. It's not something like we had dealt with before. It really does and can act like a human. Right. So it's not like our like playing chess against the computer 30 years ago, right? Which just has its own sets. This is learning on the go and generating new content, right? That's correct. And I, if we remember some of it's back to the future. I know you can use the Terminator reference in Skynet becoming self-aware, but it was really before that. If everybody remembers war games, uh, I believe it was the Whopper computer or whatever it was, was, was running a, a game theory on, on nuclear deterrence. And uh, while it was doing that, the way they figured out how to stop it was to also train it on tic-tac-toe. And then it became self-aware and figured out that tic-tac-toe is an interesting game, as is warfare, nuclear warfare, because the only way to win is not to play. That's something it figured out itself. But something that uh, is also interesting about this is the velocity that it's coming with, and also how it impacts every single industry, including law firms, including the profession that we're in. And a lot of these are different. When cloud computing came along, if you, you remember that, it still took 10, 15 years you know, maybe even longer if you think about it, for cloud to really become integrated. We had install base. You know, when you had Microsoft Word or something on your computer, and sometimes we still do, or an instance of it, you wouldn't store the information in the cloud. And it took years and years to, to move more to a cloud-based society. You know, blockchain is something specifically. It, it, it came, you know, out quickly, but it only had a very specific use. NFT was a new technology, but it didn't have you know, non-fungible tokens. It doesn't have general applicability. Same with the metaverse. Generative AI is different. Yeah. We all yeah. know this. It right. came yeah. out as free. 
I was going to say, many of the Encompass members are cloud services providers and they know. And if you ask the salespeople, it's like, how much time did you spend educating your customer on what this is, right? That took a lot. And, and, and you're right. This is, this seems so much more intuitive that people are jumping in and learning and using it. Correct. And I think if, if you even bother to use even a free version like ChatGPT, you very quickly figure out how do I get my arms around this? How can I use it? And almost all of our clients in every single business, whether it's the vendor side <clears throat> or the buyer side, they're both trying to figure out how to leverage generative AI today. And so a lot of times the lawyers are playing catch up, not just the lawyers in house, not just the lawyers as outside counsel, but the lawyers at the vendors that are actually providing this as a technology don't necessarily yet understand everything that's going on. So we're really in a wild, wild west and we'll talk a little bit about that. But what is different, it's at the velocity. Everybody knows what the potential is. So everybody's jumping in now and we're catching the comet by the tail. Next slide. This is really just, this is a good context. And Steve, I don't know if you wanna talk about this one, Um, but the context here is that generative AI is a subset of AI. And I had, you know, introduced this topic before. Artificial intelligence, which is the development of systems to mimic human behavior and problem solving has actually been around a long time. Machine learning has been around a long time, which is a component of AI and uses data and algorithms to imi- imitate. Um, generative AI is, is, is a type of learning. It's actually a type of deep learning. And it obviously generates content by learning and imitating pattern structure data and, 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 and all the data that it trains on. The point of the slide is that there's a lot of, when, you, when we're started getting into this art- artificial intelligence world, you're gonna hear a lot of new words, uh, prompts instead of input, human in the loop, meaning someone has to review the output. Generative AI, you just don't want to lose the context that it's a form of artificial intelligence. And a lot of times you'll hear new lingo. And so part of what we're going to talk about about today is that new lingo through and including large language models, which you can see on the bottom right. And those are generally speaking, the algorithms that train on gigantic data sets so that when you use a chat GPT or a BARD or a Bing or an open AI or a, you know, a, a Microsoft Anthropic, whatever, generally speaking, that generative AI product is based on a large language model. With algorithms training on data, you provide input, it provides output. Right, right. And it's, it, the other thing that struck me about all this is that a lot of the earlier forms of, of artificial intelligence were trying to just, or even machine learning or big data was another term we'd use for a while. It was just trying to get, uh, you know, get at data and analyze it much faster than humans could do so, or on a larger scale. Um, this is a little different in the sense in the, that it's creating new content. And I know we'll get into that a little bit more as we move along, but that's, you know, another step on this. It's not just analyzing data, but it's analyzing that data to then go create new content. Um, and, and where you really put this on steroids is, is um, <clears throat> automating the process. And so the, the real, if you say benefit of AI is instead of a human have to, having to prompt, having the AI do the additional prompts for you, right? Because right now it's one-to-one. You do a prompt, it gives you a response. You do a prompt, it gives you a response. You know, the true generative AI is is coming into play where it's not constantly you putting in the prompt. It actually anticipates what your next prompt would be and even creates alternative persons or alternative individuals to help anticipate that. And there's obvious good uses and potential difficult uses in connection with that. So here's your hype cycle slide. Yeah, so I wanted to um, uh, show you a hype cycle for artificial intelligence. And I actually uh, think that on this slide, there's, there's also a 2023 version, I think. But Gartner is obviously, if you don't know, they, they're in the uh, technology consulting space and a lot of other spaces. And they make it their business to track 
the time that it's going to take to go to market or just simply die for various technologies. And they created a hype cycle for artificial intelligence itself. And we're talking about generative AI mostly today. And if you look, they have five different, I would call cynical, but keeping it real categories. Whenever there's a new technology, it's called an innovation trigger. And so that's the thing that's new. And then invariably what happens is you have this peak of inflated expectations. Uh, you could see this with NFTs. You could see this with uh, the metaverse. You could see this with um, uh, a blockchain where uh, the new technology came out and it was going to be all things to all people and it was going to be the game changer. Um, th then typically everybody realizes that it's not all that or it's not all things to all people and you wind up in this trough of disillusionment because it didn't deliver what it was supposed to. Then it takes some time to figure out how it could actually work, which is the slope of enlightenment. Enlightenment, And then finally you have what I call commercialization or plateau of productivity, meaning it will actually get us there. What's fascinating about the hype cycle here for artificial intelligence is it's color coded. You can see generative AI is on the peak of inflated expectation. But if you look at the color code, it's two to five years until the plateau of productivity. So not only are you talking about the fact that it's going to go through these cycles quickly, but I think we all know within two to five years, three to five years, we're going to have real applications and, and real use of this in an enterprise way. If you're into generative AI, what most of our clients and including the law firm is figuring out, a lot of this is, we, we know what it could do, but a lot of it's still getting trained. A lot of it's still in pilot mode. A lot of it is in the, the data engineers and the others. And we'll talk a little bit about the scales of different types of generative AI. But we know of use cases today that it works. And we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about a good example of, of how we've used it. Um, but it's, it's probably accurate, I think two to five years, but the impact of generative AI is gonna be absolutely astronomically substantial uh, and, and impact every industry uh, on both internal use, external use, and especially the knowledge economy. But anyway, this is the uh, this is to give you a context of of, of how long it's going to take, probably before this is a, a game changer across the board. Right. Okay. Well, let me I, let me jump in here, give you your voice a bit of a break here. Thank you. Um, you know, there are there are a lot of different things that um, AI products can do that generative AI can do, um, and we. We tried to list a, a number of them here just to walk through. So what can it generate? Well, it can generate basically anything that a human could generate as you look at this. So, um, you know, one of the things we know about is text. You can generate text with chat GPT and, you know, other different products here. So that's, that, that's mm -hmm. maybe direct and intuitive. I think the other one that people are hearing about is images. You know, you can you can generate images through AI. You say, I want a picture of an airplane, you know, um, you know, sailing over, uh, you know, flying over um, the World Trade Center or to flying over, um, you know, the the um, the Eiffel Tower, something like that, right? And it can generate those sorts of things for you and give you those images. And detecting real images from AI generated images is a, is an interesting situation. You can generate audio with it the same way. You know, I want to have a soundtrack that is, you know, uh, scary music in such and such type. And these prompts can do those sorts of things. And there's ways, there's options for that. So there's programs doing that. You can generate video with these as well. Um, and then finally, I think one of the more interesting ones to me was because it, it just didn't seem intuitive to me, but you can generate computer code through generative AI techniques. You know, it trains on old, on other code. So whatever input you give it to train it into it, then it can generate code for you on this. And so um, GitHub's Copilot was one of the earlier ones on that, but there are a lot of different ones that do these things. So these are kind of you know, the, the five or so most significant ones, I would say, that, that you want to look at here, what the generative AI products do. Um, here's another way of looking at the products themselves um, in terms of where they fit on a spectrum of um, really what types of inputs they're using. Um, you know, 
on the left hand side you have the free publicly trained versions of it that's the ones that you're hearing about now the ones that are capturing a lot of the uh, the the press and everything else chat gpt bard and bing um, they're publicly trained public documents as you move over to the right what you get is more targeted, more bespoke versions that are trained on maybe proprietary information or limited information. Um, and we're starting to see that, you know, we see it in the legal world with um, our, uh, our law uh, legal research vendors are starting to implement things there, Westlaw and Nexus and saying like we have generative AI and they're trained on the, um, you, you know, their proprietary legal products, both the, the cases and other materials as well. Um, you know, Jason, I suppose that you could have this in individual applications. You could have an individual company that is using generative AI on its own products or, you know, a law firm using it on its own, our own work product and, and doing that. And that would be that right-hand side. And kind of in the middle are these other ones, which are um, largely um, publicly trained, but there may be some, you know, more uh, specialization that goes into those. So as you look at the products, you can see it on a, on a mm -hmm. wide range here of kind of what's it trained on, what's it using. That's right. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jason, you want to jump into this one here? Sure. So yep. it doesn't take a genius to state the obvious, I don't think, but we, we having doing this a lot over the past, I would say, uh, 18 months <clears throat> and, and pretty much every day now in some level, we've really come to blow a lot of the smoke away and come down with fairly simple three-point strategy. It starts fairly simple, but to actually execute on it. When you're thinking as a business about what you want to do with or could do with generative AI, that's what we call a use case. So when clients come to us, we ask them, what are you thinking about using? Now, just FYI, a lot of the times, by the time it gets to the lawyer, you find out that the company's already using uh, 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 generative AI products. And so it's a function of trying to wrestle to the ground what you have, put, maybe put a policy in place, do vendor due diligence and kind of backtrack. Like I said, catch the comic by the tail. But if you think about how we as the attorneys look at it, the first thing you do is what's the use case? Is it internal? Is it external? Is it both? Then you identify the generative AI products. And again, it may take genius to state the obvious, but one of the things that we should understand is usually it's not just one product. It could be multiple types of product from one vendor, some of which may be generally available, some which may be in pilot mode themselves. And there's a big difference there in terms of what you could get contractually and the uh, rights and responsibilities uh, associated with uh, beta versions versus things that they're standing behind, that the vendors are standing behind. Uh, but there's also multiple vendors with multiple products. So the thing to keep in mind is there's not one monolithic uh, generative AI product that can do everything. So when Steve showed you the various things it can do, write code, do images, do text, it doesn't take a long time for you to even figure out to ask uh, uh, Bard, to, uh, which is the Google product, to put a PowerPoint presentation together, uh, you know, or a cloud, uh, you know, the, it, you, you find the limitations of what they can and can't do pretty quickly. So in order for a company to actually get the benefit of what their use case is, you usually are talking about combining or using a number of AI products, which really goes to the third bullet. Once you identify the universe of those products, it's identifying the operational and legal benefits or risks associated with those products. And like Steve also showed you, there is the spectrum. There's the free version that's all the way on the left. There's the middle version, which usually you have to pay for or get access to, but it's not necessarily industry specific. It's not necessarily trained on your content, but they make a more of an effort to address some of the issues we'll talk about. And then there's the more bespoke far right that is actually intended to address a lot of the issues that are associated and risks associated with generative AI and the generative AI products. So you can use free versions and we'll talk about situations like that. But what we're going to see 
if you go back to the Gardner pipe cycle, is that over time, all of these models are going to start to move to the right. But in connection with your business, you're going to have to look at the use cases, you're going to have to look at the products, and then you're going to have to think based on the terms and conditions and sometimes things outside the terms and conditions, you know, whether or not there's the risk reward is worth it or whether you can even use these products for the intended use. So that's the general three point strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Jason, I just wanted to, I mean, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but there is a challenge on this in educating yourself about what these issues are and how they're going to come up. So what those, it's easy to say, you know, identify the operational and legal benefits, but you know, if, if you don't understand the technology and if we're still, the technology is still developing, how do you do that? Right. That seems like a, quite a challenge for a lot of the companies. Uh, there, there's a question just so you know, are you helping governmental entities develop Gen AI regulations and policies? We've helped quasi governmental agencies. Uh, there may be some where we're actually doing um, um, actually for the government, but a lot of the times what we're doing is we're doing it uh, uh, with quasi governmental agencies or in connection with government agencies, but not necessarily the government agency itself. Uh, having said that, um, as you know, uh, uh, President Biden's executive order came down, the G7 uh, 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 summit came down on, on international AI. So the guidance is, is, is just beginning on what you need to do, at least at the federal level, uh, with respect to AI. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing I want, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but like, um, you know, in my industry and in the industry for a lot of the Encompass members, the FCC uh, has put out a notice of inquiry asking questions about how AI technologies might be used um, in a specific context and even implementing the executive order. There's lots and lots of opportunities to comment, to help educate the government, influence the government on how they want to approach these technologies. So it's not always a one-way uh, situation. So I think it's important to, you know, for those members out there to think about these issues and consider helping the government figure these out because they are figuring it out just like the rest of us. So, yeah. okay, so that's our, that's our strategy, right? Uh, operational and legal benefits and strategies. So let's go into a little bit more about how you get around doing that. Yeah. So, uh, there's also a question that's very timely. There's a question about um, concern about using company confidential data in public tools. And uh, uh, it says trying to make the case more generic, does corporate data security get addressed in the most advanced services like Copilot? Uh, I would say, uh, so it depends on what your use case is. Always start with the use case, right? Uh, Copilot is, and all these uh Generative AI products, by the way, are updating their terms and conditions seriously every two weeks. And so, uh, and they're making progress. Uh, with respect to Copilot, what Copilot says is that you get the security the, the, uh, that is offered from Azure, okay, Microsoft. But remember, security is different from privacy. So, what you want to do every time you decide to use, also, by the way, there's Copilot that's generically available. And then there's an enterprise version of Copilot. You remember, I don't know if you saw it, but in the screen that Steve was talking about, in the middle, there was Copilot, but on the right, there was, or there should be Copilot as well. A good example would be uh, Morgan Stanley. <clears throat> so it's publicly public knowledge that Morgan Stanley had a version, a bespoke version of Microsoft Copilot and used it to train on all of its uh, uh, financial data for financial advisors in, a, in sort of a, a chatbot format. And they have successfully uh, been able to use Copilot and preserve the privacy because the Copilot in that instance does not train on their data. It doesn't get outside that model. It's not used to train other models. And in fact, it's a separate instance that is bespoke to Morgan Stanley. So the, the moral of the story on the question is, what's the use case? what's the product and some products will have free versions more generic versions and some will have enterprise versions and the enterprise versions are where people if you're concerned about privacy that's the direction where you're going is having a more bespoke version on the right 
Right. And and some of them say, or particularly in the free versions, you know, don't give us your private information. They'll put it in the prompts. Yeah. yeah. It, correct. And again, <clears throat> um, a, a lot of times when we talk about policies, so, uh, you know, I know there was a question about do you do government uh, policies? We do a lot of private company policies. And, and the question becomes, you know, do you say you can't use generative AI? Do you say you can use generative AI? And the reality is, is one, people are in the companies are going to be using generative AI, whether you want to or not. It doesn't mean you don't need a policy. But I think you should have a policy that describes, look, there's certain uses for the free versions. Uh, we'll talk about an example of that in a minute. Uh, and, and a policy could say, by the way, if you use those versions, you can't input any company information, any client information, any real information, it has to be just generic requests like you do with a Google search or something like that. But that's why intake and due diligence process is key. Be ready for a journey. <clears throat> you, th this, this, what's the use case? Well, what's the product and what are the risks? Uh, the companies are on a journey themselves over the next year to three years in particular to figure out how and when to use this. And there's a question about, do I use it in a sandbox environment with just a few folks to see how it works? Usually we see that happening and then a couple really big ideas, but that's a very much, a much more a controlled environment. One of the things we've been helping companies do is just add a couple questions uh, to a uh, vendor intake list, like you would in a due diligence from a vendor anyway. People have gotten a lot uh, uh, comfortable with asking about privacy and security when it comes to tech. So a lot of times you'll have a vendor intake or you'll have to provide as a vendor what you do in a privacy and security standpoint. The same thing now with artificial intelligence. Um, and, and we have created sort of a list of questions. Uh, if the answer comes back, yes, artificial intelligence is used, that can, that can tick off some additional questions about a lot of the issues we're gonna talk about today. But the moral of the story is, and Steve mentioned this, you have to have some understanding about the technologies and how they work, but for it really to work, you have to be more embedded with the business than maybe even you're used to doing because the business model of generative AI is, is even more intense than the business model of maybe other more traditional pieces of the work. This is different. So how do you get embedded with your client sooner than later operationally and from a legal standpoint to help guide the process is something that a lot of companies are struggling with right now. Right, right, and even outside of the you know the legal advice, right, the sales salespeople integrating with the the business and operations group, you know, and understanding that it's important, it's very important. So, um, so I had this chart to kind of give us an overview, and, and then Jason, we can walk through um, each one, at least some examples of some of what these issues are that we're talking about here. So, uh, with generative AI, when I was learning about it and going through it, I was like, okay, well, you know, we've heard about some of it. Accuracy is the one that, that we hear about them the most, but um, there are some of these other questions that, that come up, which we've, we've started to touch on with some of the questions that came out here, right? The, the privacy and the confidentiality of the data that's used for the inputs um, as well as, you know, some of the outputs. The legality and the ownership, that's an interesting one, both from looking at the inputs and what it, what it's trained on, and then the output, what's what the ownership is, how it's used. So there's going to be a number of things there uh, okay. to look at. Uh, you highlighted, you mentioned it earlier, Jason. The terms of service for uh, these products are all changing and are changing very quick, quickly. Um, so staying on top of what you know, what the promise is made when you go to chat G GPT or you go to a bespoke version, like what is it offering to you? What isn't it offering? Um, understanding that is very important as you figure out the best way to use this. And then the security of the information as well. We'll touch on a number of these ones um, as we go through. And then we'll talk after this about um, regulation and then we'll have a more open area for some questions if you want some guideposts as, as we're moving along here. So, um, you know, we listed a whole bunch of stuff here and we're gonna go through all of this. This was more for, for people later. Um, if you wanna go back and you wanna have something, you know, approaching a checklist, you know, you can use something like this as a, as a way to get through. These are the, among the things that you need to be looking at as you're trying to figure out how to use generative AI. Um, within your business or how your customers are going to be using it for the services that you're providing to them. Um, 
people walk through some of the primary ones. I know I can take this and then Jason, maybe, you know, you can take one or more of the other ones. Um, this is probably, the, you know, one of the most famous uh, situations, you know, go back to that definition. If you want to go back later on this, go back to the definition at the beginning. What Bard says is we train on data and we give you similar content, right? I thought it was very interesting. They don't promise that they're going to give you the right answer or, you know, that's not the goal of these things anymore. It's not, uh, that's different from other AI technology. So if you ask for it to generate content, it's going to generate content that is similar to what it is trained upon. That similarity may or may not be um, match up with facts. And this was a situation where that happened um, very publicly and quite embarrassingly to um, some lawyers who were filing uh, in a federal court case and they had used chat GPT to, uh, to help generate the brief. And um, that was great, except that it made up completely um, fictional cases and fictional outcomes. So what was being cited to as authorita authoritative just didn't even exist. And, um, you know, they obviously uh, ran into a lot of trouble with that. They're the poster child for how not to be using these things at this point. But um, the judge got upset. There was a lot of hearings about, uh, you know, um, recriminations uh, and penalties that they should have and, and sanctions, et cetera, on this. Um, you know, all that went through. And there are now, we're seeing a trend of some of the, some judges and some courts are saying, you know, you either can't use these tools for brief writing, or you have to certify that you've had somebody review these over at, afterwards or disclose in, in, in the fact that you're using that. There's some real questions about whether or not those are permissible, but the first thing you have to look at here when you're using any, any generative AI product is, you know, what's your tolerance for the, the so-called hallucinations on this? Um, uh, here's some of the disclaimers, Jason, that, that we had pulled, and these, these may not even be current anymore because these were from some earlier things. They, they warn you in the terms of service that these may not be correct. It may sometimes provide inaccurate or offensive conduct, uh, content rather. It may, you know, uh, result in output that doesn't reflect real people, real places, real things. Um, the onus is on you as the user to um, suss those out and understand when those are there. And that can be a, a difficult situation when you don't have the independent expertise in the area that you're using the tool for, right? This, this is a, a decision tree that was Put together about using chat gpt the first question is does it matter if the output's true or not right in some instances it is but like if i want a model for a letter to write a complaint to my congressman you know it doesn't matter whether the output is true or not because i'm going to edit it right so sure if it doesn't matter it's fine but if it does matter then do you have the expertise to verify that i think that's a really good question and are you able and willing to use that expertise and invest that time to go through and review everything. Um, that was one of the, you know, one of the problems the lawyers had um, in this. They didn't necessarily have the expertise in the particular area. They obviously didn't spend enough time going through and checking the cases and, and checking the information. Um, part of it was they didn't have access to the right legal resources to be able to do that, as I recall. But you know, these the hallucination piece is a is a big part of this that um, really needs to be addressed up front on that. Can, can we stick with this slide for just a second? Yeah. Um, so, so let me, the um, part of the reason we include this decision tree is because it made me laugh. Uh, because it obviously doesn't have all the, the decision trees you need. I thought it was hilarious because the first question and the only question, the gating item is, does it matter if the output is true? And as we all know, uh, the, the, there's more questions in that, right? That what, what about the security? What about the confidentiality? What about whatever? Um, but this was to illustrate the, the fact that uh, ChatGPT and these free versions uh, hallucinate and create errors. And so uh, if, as a threshold matter, if what you're using it for, you're relying on the output, that, that is a threshold matter. But obviously, if we were to expand this out, 
we could add a lot of the legal issues in front of it. You know, does it matter if the information that's putting in confidential? Does it matter uh, whether when you use the tool, they will provide an intellectual property indemnity for you? Okay. Uh, so so uh, the, the context of this was just an oversimplified, almost laughable uh, explanation as to the fact that these things hallucinate. However, let me, let me just say this. Uh, as you move to this bespoke version, and as you move to the paid models, and this is goes back to the question about the co-pilot, what's happening is the vendors are committing data scientists and they're committing to having their models only train on bespoke proprietary and licensed data that's more reliable. Sometimes it's your data. So as you move to a more secure environment, as you move to a more bespoke environment, as the data that the model's training on is more reliable, less hallucinogenic. As the vendors have, like Thomson Reuters does, they've got over 120 data scientists that are working on their large language models for lawyers when they use theirs. As you move into this world, a lot of the questions are starting to be addressed, and a lot of the concerns are starting to be addressed. But it's still a work in progress, and no one's waiting on that to end. We're signed up for it. We're ready to go when they're ready for the pilot, uh, but uh, a lot of the questions will be answered as you move from that free publicly trained version to the I really need this to be right version and I need it to be safe and I can't train the model and it needs to be confidential, et cetera. Right, right. So here, here's, some, here's some of that, Jason, you know, on the inputs and the privacy piece of it. Um, yes, so, so uh, privacy, we, we had the terms of service. The terms of service usually include a reference or incorporate by reference the privacy policy. But, the, but whenever we're doing a, a, a deal, uh, wh whether it's Google, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Anthropic, whether it's Amazon itself or Amazon Bedrock and Titan, which is their model, or the marketplace they have, which is Bedrock, where you can get access to their Titan model or this universe of other types of models of which Anthropic is one uh, or Meta, uh, looking at their terms of service and, and looking at their privacy policies, you have to look at it together. Most of them state that they can actually review or might review the information you put in. So one of the things you got to think about when you're, what's the use case, what's the model, what's the risk, is are you using the right model or the right versions of those models? So if you're concerned about confidentiality, you don't want that training the model. You don't want a human reviewer that's not you to be able to look at that model. You need to understand what those terms of service say because they're catching up. They're telling you what they're going to say. And then and only then can you decide whether that particular model is something that you would want to use. And uh, most of the models, by the way, uh, or a lot of them include the fact that you need to have what's called a human in the loop and humans um, need to look at it. Another thing that's interesting that is not normal, when you look at the terms of service, a lot of them now have what's called acceptable use policies, AUPs. Anybody who does work in this space, especially if you're a cloud vendor, like a lot of the folks on the call are, you know you have an acceptable use policy. And it says you can't use it to defame, you can't use it for this, that, and the other. What's happening now is a lot of these models are saying, not only that, but you actually can't use it for certain fields of use. You can't use it in healthcare, you can't use it in financial services. You can't use it when it comes to uh, uh, law enforcement. So it's not just a function of figuring out how they use what you're gonna use, but sometimes it's that you actually aren't authorized to use the model for the purpose you intend at all. Right. So food for thought. No. Okay. We talked a little bit about the confidentiality, um, you know, this is looking at confidentiality of the prompts and the information you, you put in it. Um, so, you know, a caveat here, uh, I, I'm gonna go through this one a little bit faster because I wanna talk about some of the others, but, yeah. you know, be careful uh, about which model you're using and which one you're going to be, uh, you know, what you're gonna be given to it because they make different promises about how they use the data um, that you submit to them. Um, oops. I thought I had one more, maybe I got rid of it. Um, I want to talk about the legality and the inputs, Jason. So maybe before we jump to the other piece, 
you can give us just a couple minutes on that. I looks like I took it out of our slideshow. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Just the question, about... just questions about like, is it you know, we talk about like these things are used, they're trained upon certain data. Well, how you know, do they really have access to that data? Are they permitted to have access to that data? Where does that go? It it gets a little bit farther into intellectual property law than I'm comfortable with. Sure, I'll <laughs> talk real quick about yeah. it. So, you know, whenever you do a deal uh, with a vendor or, 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 or typically from a vendor to a buyer and intellectual property is at issue, you usually have a rep that says that the product that you're using doesn't violate any intellectual third party rights and that the output that's generated doesn't violate any intellectual third party rights. One of the major issues in the large language model right now is that there's a lot of lawsuits, copyright lawsuits by uh, owners of content that, that the owners believe were in, uh, uh, unlawfully, these models were unlawfully trained on. So, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, data holders are suing the large language models, Microsoft, et cetera, uh, by claiming that they trained on th their data by scraping it on the public web or on the dark web, and they didn't have the right to do so. That, and, and so when you're doing deals with these large language model providers, you spend a lot of time as a buyer, for example, trying to get intellectual property infringement so that if you get sued for using their model, they'll defend you for it. This is a great example of where the lawyers and the contracts have not caught up. Microsoft, I think a month or two ago, and OpenAI just a couple of days ago, came out with what they're, what they're calling their copyright. They have different words for them, but basically a copyright pledge that if you get sued as a user of their model and you get sued for copyright infringement and it's within the certain guardrails and, 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 they will defend and indemnify you from that use. Of course, what's interesting is neither in Microsoft case nor OpenAI case, those provisions or thoughts are not in any agreement. They're in blogs and articles. So when you're doing business in this space, you can't just rely on the terms of service. You can't just rely on the links and the privacy policy, at least with respect to copyright infringement, you now have things that aren't incorporated into an agreement. They're just public announcements of what Microsoft and OpenAI will do. Uh, with, and, and, and normally that's a no-no, right? Normally you'd want to take that and bake it into the agreement. But again, it shows how we're still on a, a, on a maturation process about the terms and conditions and the rights and obligations of all parties using generative AI. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that, uh, you know, I noted this, you know, there's real dollars and there's real issues involved in, in these sorts of things. You know, one of the big issues in the Hollywood writer strike was, whether or not AI would be used to um, revise scripts and whether a, a human's script could be used to train the AI to generate new scripts, right? And so there's a lot of really complex issues about the inputs and what it's trained upon. So I thought that one was really interesting. I hadn't really thought about that, but obviously those in the writers, that's their livelihood and they thought a lot about it. Um, so let's jump into, um, I, I'll go, we'll go through this and then we'll be open, have a few minutes for um, some more questions if anybody has things about this. Uh, the initiatives to regulate AI uh, and, and where it is on this, anything that captures a lot of attention then starts to capture attention of the government to say, well, what is this? How are we using this? And a lot of it is you know, initially reactive to this. Couple of things I want to highlight here, and um, you know, first of all, NIST, the the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, it's a div division of the Department of Commerce, um, really has been doing some some terrific work in a number of different areas. You might be the Encompass members might be familiar with it on cybersecurity or IoT devices and IoT manufacturing. They set standards uh, on that and help at least some processes on it. They were tasked with creating a risk management framework for artificial intelligence as well. And they generated this one pretty quickly and, and they've moved on. I think, I think we might be on 2.0 already um, uh, on this, but uh, so they've gone through and created a risk management framework, which is very similar to the kind of framework for cybersecurity uh, that looks at 
the way in which AI systems should um, have safety, real-time monitoring and backstops built into it, the security and resiliency of those models and um, what they what they should be able to do. Um, looking at, you know, is it explainable? Is it interpretable? Going through all these different factors on this. So NIST has kind of started on this. The Federal Trade Commission has already started to hold of you know conduct some inquiries the way they normally do and looking at these issues, trying to gather information, trying to understand what the the industry is doing. Um, but they've issued a number of blog posts and, and other content that warns businesses about the ways they're thinking about it. And one of theirs is a very common approach for the Federal Trade Commission, which is you have to say what you're going to do and you have to do what you say. So the warnings are avoid unfair or misleading practices in, for example, over promising as to what privacy or security you might have with respect to the AI system and then not living up to those practices. So we're starting to see some of these, you know, early pieces on it. Um, I wanted to talk about the FCC and point this out because here, What's interesting to me about this one, this is a notice of inquiry that the FCC is planning to adopt at its meeting one week from today, as <clears> I'm <throat> speaking on this, November 15th, it's open meeting on AI technologies to protect consumers from unwanted robocalls or robotexts. Um, so that's been an issue that is of prime importance to the Federal Com Communications Commission. It has been one of their top ones for six or seven years at least, um, uh, avoiding unwanted robocalls. And they have put the industry through a lot of different things, uh, new authentication frameworks, robocall mitigation policies, uh, significant enforcement actions, know your customer requirements, all kinds of different things on this. Now, what the commission is asking here is, how can the government and or industry use this technology to further protect consumers, right? So they're looking at this from what can these technologies do to protect um, and implement the TCPA? So they're asking on like, how can it help the commission to uh, identify robocalls or identify those trends? How can it help the industry to block those trends? Those are some of the things that are gonna be open in this. Um, but they're also concerned about the use of the technology for harm by those bad actors. So they raise in this NOI as well, the questions about um, what is gonna happen with these technologies as they're used to generate content. Um, is that covered by the existing 1991 act, the TCPA that dealt with artificial voices is, is AI generated audio and artificial voice under the statute. That's one of the legal questions they're raising. They raise questions about some, some of the broader issues that I'm seeing start to come up with generative AI, which is distinguishing the real from the fake, right? And asking if there are ways that they can verify the authenticity of legitimately generated content or le actual voices rather than AI generated voices. So they're asking for the state of technology about watermarks, certificates, other ways that you can verify the content um, is, is or is not AI generated. So um, to that question earlier about like how helping the government, well, this is an opportunity to help the government to understand the policy, to set the policies, understanding the technologies. Um, this is a new proceeding. It is a notice of inquiry. So they're not planning rules at this stage. They're really on a fact-finding mission. And I, I wanted to highlight this for the Encompass members. You should really think about um, the impact that this is gonna have, what you're gonna wanna do. I know that Chris Shipley and your folks in Encompass are Looking at this, I would uh, not be surprised uh, if uh, they end up uh, submitting comments as well. I don't want to promise anything for you, Chris, but uh, this is is a, an interesting twist in looking at these generative technologies and what they mean for specific regulations. And I think that's you're going to see more and more of this as people get more and more comfortable 
with the technology, start to understand some of those use cases. You know, Jason, in your term, this is the FCC asking about a specific set of use cases um, for generative AI technologies in stopping robocalls or in generating robocalls by the bad actors and how would they deal with that. So um, it's a very interesting development, I think. It's more, it, it's different from the, hey, here's some of the risks you need to worry about or remember to, to cover certain things on this. Um, and then uh, lastly, and this could be an entire um, webinar on its, itself on this, um, just because of the large number of things that were in this, but there was an executive order issued by President Joe Biden on uh, October 30th on safe, secure, trustworthy artificial intelligence. Um, it is one of the first comprehensive executive orders addressing this, and it touches on um, many of the topics that were discussed here, security, safety, privacy for AI. It is applicable to a number of different industries, like technically it only binds the federal government um, in certain federal government actions. It's gonna have implications within the private sector and industry uses outside of federal government. It's not specific to generative AI. It talks about a number of different types of AI. Um, but it will be applicable to the generative AI cases that we're talking about. And just a couple of the things that I wanted to point out here, and then Jason, you may have more you want to talk about that's in there because it was it's chock full of things. Um, it again asked NIST to develop um, standards for safety and security of AI. That's going to be used by the agencies for figuring out how they use it. Um, it uh, has uh, talks about the creation of test beds. It talks about having developers of dual use foundation model AI to submit test results to the federal government for review and evaluation before they use it. So they have that better picture of what is going to be involved there. Um, standards for authenticating content, that's the watermarking thing the FCC referenced as well. Um, and then guidance for use of AI to um, address the digital equity, digital uh, inclusion initiatives of the government more broadly. You know, the ways in which the AI might impact positively or negatively bias in housing or bias in federal benefits. Um, the, the generative AI is only as good as the models that it's trained upon and the information it's trained upon. If that trained data has bias built into it or implicit bias and different things, then the output is going to be bad. This is, you know, in my mind, it's a formulation of the old garbage in, garbage out adage uh, with respect to this. So those are some of the main things that are set forth in this executive order that are going to um, really play out over the next few months. Uh, Jason, I don't know if there's anything added that struck you that you thought would be most interesting here for this audience. I think the only thing I would add is that, uh, like Steve said, you could do probably a few separate seminars on these, but generally about the executive order and then also about industry in an industry specific and agency specific. But I will say that this is going, there's things that have to happen right now, uh, like, for example, the agencies of, uh, in order to implement the order, appointing a chief AI officer and then developing their strategy and, and doing a few other things. But um, I actually tried to use generative AI to, to put this ch chart together, and it didn't work very well. But if you take a look at this 110-page or so executive order, uh, every age, almost every agency that matters has timelines in which to do things on 90, 150, 120, 150, 270. There are certain things that have to be done. So the, the, I would say that the executive order was comprehensive, but it's going to lead to a even further set of comprehensive additional uh, d directives and, and, and other responsibilities as the agencies do as they are directed to do under the executive order. So while comprehensive, it's just the beginning. Yep, okay, all right. And with that, we have probably only about a minute or so. Um, I don't see any questions in our queue, but um, I'll do this. Chris, I'll see you back. I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see all of us. Um, I, I thank everybody. I hope you found this very informative. Um, if anything comes up or Chris, you had anything, we can address at least one or two. Oh, sure. And, and it does sound like there's an appetite for, for more here. I just wanted to uh, point out Joshua Williams's comments to, uh, to the two of you said it was very informative. Uh, and it sounds like there's uh, appetite for, uh, 
for some additional work. Uh, I, the you know the the Biden executive order, I think, uh, you know, potentially is is another topic that we could explore uh, at a later date. But um, I just wanted to thank you both and and Steve to your point on what the FCC is doing. I know that the the our working our, our robocall and robotext uh, working group is going to be looking at that uh, particular uh, item uh, a little bit further down the road. Um, uh, we were going to touch on it last week, but uh, had to cancel our our call. But um, we're looking forward to that discussion. And if you'd like to join us on that, uh, please just feel free to reach out to me and let me know and, and we can include you on that conversation. Uh, Jason, yeah, there was the one question that you'd answered um, uh, in the Q&A on your own. I'm not sure if you wanted to to mention it uh, to the larger group. Uh, you know, Josh had asked, you know, you mentioned that Gen AI companies frequently change their privacy policies. Will there be a conclusive policy for all companies to abide by? Jason, you'd, you'd uh, written a response. I'm not sure if you wanted to mention it to folks that might not have had a chance to see it in the Q&A. Okay, yeah, basically I just said um, th there's not going to be a conclusive comprehensive policy for all companies to abide by. Uh, it, it, we also have uh, the consumer context. It is being worked on, but right now it's state by state. You are going to have agency by agency coming down over the next year or two talking about things, but it's still going to be a patchwork. You know, we don't have a national privacy law. That's just the way it is. And then also there's a big difference between domestic and international. So keep in mind, if you do work in or buy from vendors, uh, places other than the United States, that's a, those are whole different regimes. And uh, in some instances, like in Europe, they're a little ahead of us on, on privacy policies. But the answer is generally, unfortunately, no. Yep. There we go. Well, that's very helpful. Right. Um, go ahead, Steve, I'm sorry. Did you wanna mention anything? No, I, just, I just wanted to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. No, thank you both. This has been great. And, um, you know, we, uh, the Encompass webinar series, you know, features a lot of different topics uh, on issues uh, of interest to our members. Uh, so appreciate you both being here to talk about that. Look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, the next time for the next topic. Maybe it'll be on generative AI or, or other AI topics, or uh, maybe we'll have to get into how it um, um, is going towards uh, that robocall item in particular, Steve. But uh, but thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, you'll be able to find this on our YouTube page uh, for those of you that have joined us today and would like to uh, revisit any of the parts of the uh, of today's webinar. Uh, thanks and have a great day. Look forward to seeing you soon.